Hello everyone, my name is Andrew, I'm from Catalyst and I'm here to talk to you about Moodle Asset Archiving, cleaning up your Moodle with a growing uh, footprint of data. How do I do that? Yep, sorry. So Catalyst IT, we're the premium sponsor here. Uh, we were awarded Partner of the Year on Monday, which is amazing. Thank you very much, Moodle. Uh, we've been doing Moodle for a number of years, and we have a global team, uh, and we do uh, we do big Moodles. So we have been doing big Moodles since around 2008. Uh, we were one of the first organisations to be associated with Moodle on AWS. So based on that experience, I wanted to share some insights and some stories and some things that might be of use to you in a growing Moodle footprint, right? So as part of the digital asset archiving, part of the, the thing I wanted to do first is just talk a little bit about the word archiving because there's a lot of definitions out there on the internet around archiving. Uh, and, you know, it's a historical thing. Archiving is not new. We've been archiving physical documents for some time. And I sort of came up with the first definition of archiving, the long one there, which I'm not going to read. But the, the layman term for archiving I like is, you know, keeping things available for future use, but with less storage and clutter. And I think that's an applicable uh, definition for Moodle. But I want to focus on the future use component, right? Because you should in the future, it's obvious, but you should in the future be able to actually use it, right? It's obvious, but I say it all the same. And and I mentioned this a few times, you need to be aware of legal considerations with archiving. It's, it's real, it's the world we live in, in terms of retention and deletion. And also, the restore process of how people will get access to archive data needs to be explored and documented and made clear prior, you know, because it matters, because it plays towards the ability to do future use. So, um, once again, compliance and archiving. A lot of organisations have pretty ordinary uh, and old and sometimes silly backup and uh, archiving policies because they were built in a time, they were made when it was dependent on how many tape drives you had or how many small disks you had available. And good, ar good ar archiving policy doesn't mean you're compliant and being compliant doesn't mean you have good archiving policy. So here's a question for you. Who, who remembers, the, do you remember your first ever digital camera? So let's say that was in, yes, I remember my first ever digital camera. Let's say, let's say that was in 2008, right? So who could, if they were at home, get access to all of the photos they took in 2008? Okay, who could get access to all the photos taken in October in 2008, quickly and easily? Okay, uh, who woke up one day and decided that we're going to get rid of all of our photos that are older than five years because we just don't need them? Okay, I certainly don't. Uh, I just wanted to give an example, and here's some photos. Of, uh, actually, here's some photos from us, and some of these are well from before 2008, and since some old photos of Catalyst. Just give you an example of a data set that it isn't all about. Every data data asset needs to go through a cycle of use, archiving, and deletion. Right? There are digital assets that you pretty much want to keep forever. A big uh, a big data footprint is not always wrong, right? Like you shouldn't, there is not a process where everything has to be discarded. So Moodle and archiving, what are the common pro uh, problems? Now, I only have sort of 15 minutes, so I just wanted to pick the big ones. So what are the organizational problems that people are trying to solve around a big Moodle? Because that's generally the context. So often it's too much repetition, clutter, and junk. Lots of copies of courses, stale data, um, server and cloud constraints. You know, we're running out of storage on our infrastructure. We don't have enough disks. There's too many files. Cost management, because we're spending too much on our IT infrastructure. Or once again, co compliance and legal considerations. It's important, but usually quite frustrating. So let's explore that question of our Moodle site data is overflowing or growing too fast. A lot of organisations in the COVID period, their Moodle got fatter and fatter and fatter, right, in terms of more and more data got in there. And this sort of scenario, that's meant to be a picture of a a, a, a hard disk exploding from too much data. That was the best of the, the bad options that AI gave me. So, you know, let's imagine a world in which there was an eight, ter eight terabytes of data in, in 2019 and then 12 and 2020 and then 15 and then 18 and then 24. That, that's a pretty common scenario. Um, and Catalyst has numerous Moodles that are well over 100 terabytes, by the way. 
And that looks like a trajectory that's problematic to organisations because they might have limited storage or, or they, might, um, they might have ideas about what their budgets are and something needs to be done. So when you are faced with this issue, don't just look at the storage total, right? Because it's not necessarily about the right number, the right amount of storage that should live in your Moodle. Uh, you know, ask questions like, I mean, hopefully there's some useful tips in here that might actually solve some people's problems, but often it's not quite this, you know. How are your course backups set up, right? Course backups often can be set up in ways in which you're storing far too many copies of the same thing. Um, are you using media files in ways that are swelling your data storage unnecessarily? Like putting big raw uh, media files inside Moodle is not particularly efficient. Um, you should either they should be they should be transcoded better, or you should be using a video rep a repository. Can you see any patterns or classifications around the, sw the swelling in data? Is it particular faculties? Is it particular courses? Is it particular professors? Um, and the other one is how much of your data is associated with courses that are no longer being delivered or have not been delivered in some time? That's a useful one in some of the difficult discussions around defining old content. Um, you know, what else can you see about your data footprint? You know, things like log storage, which is not a magic wand, but still worth asking. And the first question which I put last is, what is your organization's data storage budget? Right, like often there isn't one. But that, that, that allows you to make decisions with periods as it grows. So the other problem is, you know, we've got too much old stuff, right? We've got this, we've got this Moodle that has old courses and we, we know we've got to do something about it. That causes problems, uh, we're not using the material, it's outdated, we don't want people to mistakenly choose it. So let's imagine a situation, and we've had this discussion so many times, we work with clients, especially with the 3.9, 4.1 migration, sorry, upgrade. Um, imagine you've got, a, you've got a reasonable size Moodle with 3,000 courses in there, you're a university, you've got a course AI in Economics 2022. We're keeping that one, of course, right? But you've got a course that's, you know, HTML marketing, you know, 1998. Okay, Moodle wasn't around in 1998, but let's say 2008, right? An old course that no one's using, you're never going to deliver again, and you go, yep, that's old, we've got to get rid of it. The challenge we see, or have seen with our clients, is that you know, there'll be the, what we call the gray area between the definite yes and the definite no. For example, fashion in 19, 1980s Libya, that might be a really important part of analyzing social change in the Middle East, right? That might be something that someone still actually wants to use. That might have good learning assets in it, right? You know, philosophical maths, cheer dancing polar bears, whatever, it's not always easy to define the yes or no when you you look at an already full Moodle and hence this idea to just get rid of all the old or bad content often isn't quite as easy as people think. And then the exercise, you don't really get rid of much. I'm in Europe, so are you Achtung, uh, which I believe means be careful. So the, the other one, that, uh, does anyone in anyone's organisation, if you prepared to, I'll put my hand up because we do have what we call an archive Moodle instance, which is like an old version of Moodle before you upgraded that you sort of keep somewhere so you can go and look at it, right? This is a popular approach to maintaining copies of old content, but you do need to be very careful because an archive Moodle, like 3.3 or 3.1 or whatever, or 3.9 soon, is actually a production Moodle, right? Like it is a production Moodle with the expectations around um, data protection and backups and all those sort of things, and sometimes it doesn't get treated like a production Moodle. Uh, Moodle doesn't know it's an archive. Moodle doesn't have an, a, mo uh, a native archive mode. So, you know, there are things that could happen in your Moodle your archive Moodle that would be very bad. You know, for example, if Cron decided to run and send lots of emails out or something like that, or someone uploaded a forum post, or, you know, there's, there's things around application updates, potentially access control could all be cooked because you remove it from your IDP and you put a couple of logins so that people can log in and then you suddenly lose all this access control that's very important around who can see data. You know, should students have access? Absolutely not, but someone might decide that's a good idea. What is your end of life for these 
applications because they shouldn't just sit there. Uh, it shouldn't be internet available, but often it is because that's what makes it more usable. So we're very, very cautious about archive instances of old Moodles because they tend to just hang around forever. And the risk around, I mean, you know, the risk around uh, data breaches and student details being published or any of that stuff is you know is very very real uh, and only getting it's not to say the uh, the people are hacking more but certainly the consequences of these things is more and more real so the other approach is shipping off course backups um, it's fine but course backups are a, a relatively inefficient way of doing storage and also you run the risk of once again losing access control and and digital repositories are sometimes a bit of a mess so a big Moodle is not a bad Moodle. I want to leave you with that thought. And we love big Moodles. So that's all I've got time for. Come and see us a load at the booth. Thanks, Andrew. So we have a few minutes for questions, if there are any. Yep. Literal mic runner. Uh, do you have any suggestions when dealing with files in Moodle? I, I see all your points on this chart, but the uh, storing of files in Moodle is uh, you have to go into the tables, view the huge tables, and then you have to find the hash of that table, uh, uh, that file, and then delete it if you want to get rid of it, or if you want to find duplicate videos and everything. And, and uh, so there's missing just now a sort admin file explorer where I just can see where is that one used or whatever. Do you have any hints? How do you deal with uh, thousands of files and get rid of them? Uh, so we follow the, the wise words of our clients in these things, but um, look, analyze, report, explore. Okay, so Moodle should actually defend against duplicate files being uploaded because of the way the, uh, the abstraction layer works for the file system. So you shouldn't get a lot of duplicate copies of large files. Uh, but you, you need to analyze. You need to look for certain things, you, and it isn't always easy. Um, but you need to, first you need to, Define the question you're trying to answer, right? Please, I want to find all the files that are in courses that no one has enrolled in for whatever, right? And that's a solvable problem, right? There are a lot of, a lot of SQL out there that has been published that would help you get some of the way. But some of the SQL will become quite complicated um, and it maybe even needs to be a custom script or a custom report. Um, you know, you could conceivably plug in your Moodle database into a business intelligence system or something like a reporting tool like IntelliBoard, but you need to actually actively and iteratively explore understanding the question you're trying to answer uh, because it, it can be quite difficult. All right, uh, thank you for that, really interesting. Uh, a kind of, I don't know if it's a unique user case, we have students that do a two-year course, 20 modules, uh, but the awarding body requires that they uh, can access for five years, which is frustrating. That means we end up often with hundreds of students who haven't logged in for three or four years. They're just, it, that to me is clutter, but I appreciate the need. What's your thoughts on, for example, downloading that category or that, that collection of modules and having a separate Moodle, which should they be required to access again, it's in a separate space and away from the main VLE. Does that cause more complications or is it better to actually just accept that I'm going to have hundreds of dormant accounts and, and live with that? It, it, look, it, it depends, but I will say that there is an overhead to every Moodle instance, right? Especially if it's a busy one that has a bit of data and is important organisationally. Um, and if you're using a Moodle in ways that aren't, isn't for delivering, actually delivering education, that you do need to think about making sure that that's not going to bite you. Um, but I mean, you could you could choose either approach. Uh, you could choose either approach. It might also depend, in your case, around whether or not they're using a, an IDP, like an a, a, a organisation level identity provider, which might roll their uh, accounts over conceivably, and that, that might be a consideration. But both are viable, it's just a matter of what works for you. I, don't, I think there'd be pluses and minuses to both approaches. We have time for one last question. 
Hello, I'm from the uh, Profuturo Foundation. I had a question regarding certifications because we've been running for six years and we managed not to delete anything <laughs> yet. <laughs> but uh, we, get, uh, we get teachers asking for certifications of uh, courses they did six years ago. So the only thing we can actually manage to get those certifications is to have, uh, is to have the course actually available. So how have you managed that before? Because uh, once you work with public organizations, sometimes they require exactly the same modules, even if the course has evolved, and you have a second version of the same course. Uh, they need exact, um, the exact activity times, exact modules they actually did. So how do you manage them? Do you generate them before archiving them or something like that? So you have the actual record that the course was done? Um, I, there is a great convenience to having everything in Moodle and it's staying in Moodle, right? There is a great convenience to that. So, I mean, your situation, it depends to some degree about how much data gets generated and how, how, how big the footprint is. If it's not causing you operational problems to keep things inside Moodle, then maybe you just keep things inside Moodle. But if you export it, then you need to be very clear that you've exported it in a way that will make sense 10 years in the future or something, right? Because that's one of the great risks of removing things things from Moodle is that versions change, things change, and you know, it will probably work, but you don't, you're not as sure as if it's living inside Moodle. So there's nothing wrong with leaving things inside Moodle, but with some organizations, they have just such a massive footprint of data. Like if you have courses where people are uploading a lot of files and all that stuff, then it's, it's more of an issue. But if you have like a compliance-based training system, for example, where there isn't really that much data coming from the user, and it's just like tasks and certain Certifications and a small level assessment, the data footprint is quite small. So you don't have to pull things out. That's we're sort of we're hooked on this idea of rotating and removing data and purging data. But historically, that was because we didn't have any storage. Now we do. So you, you don't have to remove it. And it sounds as though you're, it's easier for you if it stays where it is. So leave it where it is.